built uh, on Twitter and other, other places. We'll see if it... But it's the current year, which is a kind of liberal argument against anything they don't like. Uh, so someone will vote Trump or someone will you know, support immigration restriction. Uh, but it's the current year. How can you be against that? It's this kind of ever evolving agenda uh, that uh, it is a really like a sense of, of, uh, of communism in a way, although it's a conference that never changed. Um, well, I think I'm just going to turn that on its head. I think we have to be authentic to the current year. And what I mean by that is that the old right is, in a way, conservatives who don't have anything to conserve anymore. Conservatives, as we know them, like, you know, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, these types, and all the people who follow them. Uh, they're conservatives in the sense that they're conserving some nostalgic image, a picket fence Americana, some America that exists in their minds, things like that. We want to be authentic to the current year. We want to be authentic to the fact that we live in this. We live in a fragmenting and decaying society. Uh, we live in a society of a great deal of degeneracy. We live in a society in which the fundamental moral norms are liberal. And we are attempting to fight our way out of that. And sometimes that's going to involve using the means that are at hand. That's going to involve being a part of this fragmenting group. That's going to involve dank memes. It's going to involve Pepe. It's going to involve unleashing a little chaos. But that is being authentic to the current year. That's being authentic to the time. Uh, in terms of Trump, uh, I'll be very brief. I've probably gone. That's all right. It's my conference. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of Trump, I, I think there there is a uh, a bit of a myth that Trump invented the old right or something. Well, there's a very stupid myth and that is that uh, put forth by Hillary Clinton that the Godfather of the old right is Vladimir Putin. Um, being being that I was thinking being he's our Godfather. I don't know if he is funding us or. But if he's our godfather, I guess we should pay him for So I don't know. Anyway, that is rather dumb. Uh, but there's also a notion that this just was invented by the Trump movement. Uh, that is false. Uh, the alt-right was not invented by the Trump movement. I think that what we see in Trump is a, it, it's too like a degree of a policy. Uh, the fact that Trump from day one defined his campaign in terms of immigration. I think that was key and extremely important. But I don't think our support of Trump is really about policy at the end of the day. Uh, I, I think it actually, you could say it's about style over substance. Because, you know, policy, what does that really matter? Um, I think it's really about Trump's style, the fact that he doesn't back down, the fact that he's willing to confront his enemies, mostly on the left. There's something about them, there's something high energy that is infectious. That you look at that and you think, this is what a leader looks like. This is what we want. Even in all of his vulgarity, I would never deny that. This is what we want in a leader. This is someone who can make the future. Uh, so I think that is the way I would define our, our love of Trump, is that he seems, he, seems to be willing to, he seems to be willing to go there. He seems to be willing to confront people. He, and that's very different than a couple. So it's it's really, Trump, Donald Trump is not all right in the sense of his ideas. Uh, Donald Trump is not really all right in terms of his policies. Uh, with the exception, actually, of foreign policy and to a degree immigration, I've actually been fairly disappointed with what he's put forth in terms of policy. It sounds like a lot of Republican stuff. Um, I, I think it would be much better if he uh, reshuffled left and right and really try something dramatically different, radically different. Uh, it really is about him. And it's about, in a way, projecting onto him our hopes and dreams. Uh, there's something called meme magic, and that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, we have not been made by Trump, but we want to make Trump. And we want to imagine him in our image. And that is maybe, you could see that in a meme of Trump as a Napoleon or or Trump as a uh, some figure out of the Dune and novels and an archaeo future and a robotic suit of armor fighting enemies. All of that stuff is silly and all that stuff is ridiculous, but it actually gets at something real. 
uh, and that is that we want something more. We want something heroic. We want something that is not defined by liberalism or individual rights or bourgeois norms. We want something that is truly European and truly heroic. And that is fundamentally what the alt right is about. Thank you very much. Could I take a few questions, maybe? Yeah. Does, does anyone have any immediate questions? And then I'll let Peter speak. Yeah, Rosie. Um, we have the logo, and can you just like talk? What's, what's the story of the logo? How did that come about? Well, um, I made it. And what's like, why? I guess. Well, there's a, one thing that there is a, a, a style that uh, fits with things that I like, which is a kind of uh, synth wave nostalgia. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's definitely evoking that. Uh, I just wanted to evoke something that's new and dynamic and futuristic. Um, you know, I've seen enough billowing flags and eagles with a tear. I've, I've seen enough of that stuff for a lifetime. Uh, and uh, I think we should be new and for the future and young and edgy. And that's what the old right's about. If I had billowing flags and crying eagles, uh, I would not be authentic to the old right. Well, why, I, mean, I guess, like, like, what's the purpose of having a logo? Well, first off, there is no one leader of the alt right. So I cannot enforce anything. If I tried to enforce anything with the alt right, they would uh, be up in arms against me. Uh, so this is not like this is our one logo or something. Uh, other people have some. This is mine, and it can get out. It can I can throw it out there. It can be shared. People can like it or not. But it's uh, it, it's how I it's how I see it. I see the alt right as a young movement, as a dynamic movement. Um, and, and not as a just kind of, you know, kitsch nostalgia movement like conservatives. Hi, um, you said we live in an age that's uh, fragmenting. Yeah. Lots of degeneracy and even decaying. Yeah. Does uh, American society as it now exists, warts and glories and all, does it merit the allegiance of uh, people of European descent? That's an interesting question because, um, and I could probably write a book on that question. Uh, I'll try to. Like. <laughs> uh, I think it's I think it's uh, authentic to be ambivalent about America. Um, I think w running away from it and not under not understand not thinking about American history and American identity, running away from that and just saying we're we're all right we're. We're Europeans or something like that. I, I think there's a problem with that because it, it does, it's not grounded in anything. I think you, you have to be grounded in the here and day, here and now. So I, I think that you know people this make America great again is in a way a perfect uh, synopsis of this because that that slogan is in itself ambivalent. Uh, make America great again implies that America is not great. So would you call yourself? And, or the alt right anti American in any sense? Um, I'll speak for myself because, <laughs> but uh, I think that we question some of the most basic norms of, uh, um, we question America's founding myths. That's how I would put it. Uh, if you want to look at the Declaration of Independence, it's not just the, this notion of you know, all men created equal that I would object to, it's also this notion that states come into being because people want to create these entities to defend their inalienable rights or something. I, I find that just total hokum nonsense. That's not how any government ever came into being, including the United States. So the fact that you would talk about that is like talking about unicorns. Uh, so yes, I think we do question some of the many fundamental myths of modern America. What, how far back those go, I do think that they were present in the, in the founding generation. Uh, but uh, but they're certainly present now. I think if anything holds, if, if, if something holds America together now, it is basically this gobbledygook about equality. We all come here from different places to achieve our dreams and stuff like that. Uh, I, I would say the alt-right rejects that uh, fundamentally. Uh, I think many of the alt-right certainly admire the founding generation and what was accomplished, however. So it's, it's an ambivalence. Yeah, uh, you and then Dave. Yeah. In, in Washington, D.C., residents of Washington, D.C. don't have the same kind of voting rights as other Americans. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the congressional represent, representative or two senators. How has that lack of rights benefited Washington, D.C. or not? 
but like can you use this city as a case study for where there aren't voting yes. rights in the United States? Yes. Uh, I don't, I, we don't really care about that. No, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. No, I mean, that's just not important. <laughs> okay, so you talked about having realistic relations with all states, and including yeah. Russia, and sort of leading into Russia. One, what do realistic relations with Russia mean? Two, you described as a white power. Is there either foreign or domestic policy that Russia is uh, is is using right now that you think we should we should be looking at? It's a bit more expansionist than I think what you'd recommend for America, domestic uh, for America. Uh, well, I don't think expansionist. I mean, in, in terms of uh, you know, you know, in terms of Ki Kiev is obviously no longer under uh, Russian dominion, uh, but in terms of Crimea, I mean, that, that's a fundamentally Russian zone. Um, I, I think that our relationships with Russia would be uh, very friendly, and we would understand their historical uh, and, and, in many ways, imperial basis. I mean, Russia is an empire before it's a nation state. But in domestic policy, anything that Russia. As, a, as the one white power, anything that they're doing. Is it, I would not, okay, okay, Vladimir Putin is not all right. Vladimir Putin is, is, is not a nationalist, and maybe in the, in the way that some of, uh, some of you know, we here are. Uh, I think Vladimir Putin is a normal person, um, and that makes him abnormal in the current you know, global politics. Uh, there, there, there are some examples of like pro-fertility policies that I would certainly uh, like. Um, they're in a very different situation than we are. It's, uh, I think the Russian zone, especially 90% ethnically Russian, more or less, and so on. So it's a very, it would be a very, we'd be in a very different situation here. But I don't, it's not about emulating Vladimir Putin. I mean, Vladimir Putin is part of the past uh, just as much as Hillary Clinton is. Uh, it's just, it, it's something, it's just a, a more usable past. It's something that, to, that we look to with more uh, admiration. Um, but yeah. Okay, you already had your shot. Yeah. When you say that people who uh, convey the idea that they you know, the parentheses, put out the parentheses, put out, uh, if you look at the epi, uh, what are the ideas that if you start doing your work for you? What is that work? What do they convey? Well, uh, in particular, what well, you, both. Let's say both, both the frog and the uh, and the frog. Uh, the frog seems to, is is a, an expression of a, a certain. Uh, it's a smug frog, but it's an expression of, uh, of a of a willingness. This is someone who's a, who's willing to speak the truth. Um, in terms of parentheses, I, I would mention that um, you know part of my own development was becoming aware of neoconservatives, becoming aware of the way in which Zionism, uh, I think, perversely uh, influences American foreign policy. Um, and so the, the parentheses is in a way of locating people who have maybe a different interest than American interests. Uh, the fact that all of these people adopted the parentheses was uh, hilarious. It's some not, you know, the people who wouldn't have to fight themselves as Zionists who adopted the parentheses because they perceive it as, as a leftist. Yeah, they're different. Ask, they're different things that we oppose. Uh, yes, you and the you. Hi. So um, I noticed late in August that Mr. Mr. James Watson, Dr. James Watson, was uh, scheduled to speak at New York University, and a group of medical students and biology students wrote a letter saying, you know, that he was you know, and misinformed, and there's no evidence for a claim that it's made in the past, and that made me think, and you know, perhaps you'd like to comment on that, or you, Mr. Brimler, or you, Mr. Uh, Taylor. But I was also wondering, do you think that? In any way, you're similar to him insofar as um, you have enemies who see you as malevolent or misinformed, like a dupe, like misinformed by Jensen or Shockley or Rushton. And uh, do, you, do you think that, that Hillary Clinton, Clinton sees you more as malevolent or um, like you're, you've, been, you've been fooled, like you're incompetent for believing in racism? I seriously doubt she thinks that. I mean, you, you don't address people in a major speech if they're incompetent, you know, it's like, the Flat Earth Society. We, we need to do a political speech on these people. Like they're, they're just wrong. You know, we need like bring out some charts. You know? I mean, you don't do that to someone. You you, you attack or censor someone uh, because they're right. Okay, Scott. Can you give uh, us a sense of where you think you stand in terms of influence in comparative terms? Like uh, that means the right wing parties of Europe, some of which are coming out of marginality and are now in the you know, 30, 20, 30, even 40% range, or, uh, uh, you know, or other, you know, 
insurrections that start off small, like, you know, the Neo -Bons. Algerian National Front or something. Well, like I, or something. you know, right. yeah, I understand your question. Um, obviously, we live well, in- Or are you just 200 people on Twitter? You know? <laughs> well, it's not 200 people on Twitter. I mean, because the, the thing is, you can look, there, there are 200 people or so, or so who would come and attend a conference now. I mean, that, that's a hard core. That we're, we're thinking about tens of thousands of people who are actively posting and, and involved in this, maybe hundreds of thousands. And in terms of people who know of us, we're now into the millions. So it's not 200 people on Twitter. Uh, in terms of your other question, uh, on, on, in terms of our influence, we, there, there are two things going on. First off, that we live in a duopoly. Uh, politically, I, I don't. I think a third party is a non-starter. Uh, so it's it's difficult to measure where we are in terms of that. But there's another aspect to it, and that is that the alt right really is an in, it's an intellectual movement. Um, I want to have influence, and whether that's with Republicans or Democrats or academics or people at Twitter or bloggers, people on Twitter, so on. That's we want to influence them. So it's very different. I, as, as opposed to some of the movements you mentioned, I would say that the neoconservatives are actually a model to be emulated in the sense that they had a tightly organized group of people who were very small in terms of the hardcore, but they had tremendous impact. I mean, they remade the world uh, for the worse, in uh, my opinion, and probably yours. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that is probably a better model. Uh, let me let Peter speak, just so uh, I, I feel like people, you know, get new questions as I as I answer some. So let me just let Peter speak, and then we can we can stay here as long as you want. And Peter, Jared, and I will be in this hotel well after this conference to speak with anyone. So uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I, Peter probably needs no introduction. Uh, Peter is a a longtime uh, conservative activist, conservative writer, longtime financial analyst. Uh, he's the founder and the editor of vdare.com, which is uh, an important website in the old rights. So, Peter, welcome. Still 15? Oh, yeah, 15 minutes. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's talk as much as that. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, as, uh, as Richard very kindly pointed out a little while ago, I'm incredibly old. <laughs> but I'm born in the same month, within a few days, of Hillary Clinton, if you can imagine, so you see how serious it is. Um, and I shouldn't hear it all, actually. Uh, uh, I was, I mean, I've been involved in American, in spite of my accent, in the American conservative movement since 1972, when I worked for John Ashcroft, that, uh, that's uh, Ashbrook, Ashbrook, not Ashcroft, uh, against, uh, against Richard Nixon. So I've been involved on, on the sort of distant right, a distant right, uh, pretty well forever, uh, and the, the, the reason I'm here uh, is that uh, uh, um, just over 20 years ago I, I wrote a book on the immigration, alienation, which essentially ended my career in the mainstream media, although that, didn't, that took some time to become clear, and it was it basically argued that, that immigration was, was a big problem to, kicked up by the 65 Act, and that it should be stopped. My conclusion was actually exactly the same as Anne Calder's conclusion in her book, Adios America, 20 years later. Nothing had changed, it just got a lot worse. Um, and so uh, I founded this website, mediare.com, because uh, uh, at that point there was no way, no way to, on the left or the right where you could discuss immigration or it's, um, or it's uh, the facts or, or, or arguments about immigration, you just couldn't deal with them. Mediare.com is... Um, is a, a forum site. We'll accept uh, people from, from any point of view. We have, we have a weak opportunity at editors. We accept anybody from any point of view, any color or creed, as long as they have something to say about America's post 1965 immigration disaster. We even have a few Democrats who write for us. Um, but it, it happens that immigration is one of the issues that the alt right is deeply interested in. Uh, and, and because of that, I have a number of writers who are, who are actually members of the alt-right and very prominent members, uh, obviously much younger than I am. Uh, James Kirkpatrick, Alexander Hart, Washington Watcher, for example. These people all live in Washington. They work in uh, institutions in Washington. They may be your colleagues. They may be next, sitting next to you at this conference, but they do not wish to show their faces. These are people who have careers, who have, who have families to support, and so on and so forth. And they simply can't speak out on an issue of public policy. Uh, and expect to go unpunished in the land of the free. So that's why I'm here to speak for them. I'm too old to care. Um, 
the, the, I want to make uh, uh, three three points about this uh, what we call America's immigration disaster and its relationship to the to the alt right. First of all, um, what's happened here? Uh, uh, the fact that Trump has been able to take this party away from the professional politicians, the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen in American politics. I can't think of any parallel. Uh, uh, and the fact that the immigration issue has gotten out of control, I mean, it's gotten into politics in an uncontrollable way. This is entirely the fault of the, of the political establishment, and particularly what we call Conservative Inc., the sort of corrupt, parasitical. Uh, Organized uh, de development that occurred after Reagan was elected and after uh, um, after uh, the, 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 there were jobs to be given out. Um, I should say, by the way, that one of them had to be all of it. Uh, I actually remember when the Conservative movement worked. I remember when politics worked. I, I'm not like Richard, who was too young to, he wasn't even born when Reagan was around. I, I was working on the Hill then for a few US sides who I won't name because I don't want to get into trouble. Into trouble. <laughs> uh, uh, and you know, I think Reagan was a great man and he, he solved a lot of very serious problems, which were then very serious problems, uh, uh, above all the Cold War. I take the Cold War very seriously. But that was then, this is now, and now we're confronted with a whole new range of problems. And the fact is that the younger people, and people younger than Richard particularly, they've never seen politics work. They've never seen the Conservative movement do anything at all for anybody except, of course, his donors. Uh, and so that explains the extreme cynicism of the, of the alt right and, the, and its, uh, its willingness to take a gamble on, on somebody as, as uh, a character as well as Trump. Um, uh, t 20 years ago, this summer, uh, there was a bill in Congress which was official Republican Party called the Smith Simpson Bill. It, it, uh, it encapsulated, it embodied the recommendations of a thing called the Jordan Commission which was headed by a black congressman, Democratic congressman, Barbara Jordan. And many of its recommendations are exactly the same as what Trump is saying today. In, in particular, it meant a serious cutback on, 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 legal, on legal immigration. Uh, and had that bill gone through, uh, we were, the, part of the country would be like 10 or 15 million people smaller, and we would not now be in the, in the, in the, in the problem, where, or quite so deep into the problem that we're in now. But it didn't go through because of a coup within the Conservative movement. There was a civil war in the Conservative movement on this question. And, and we lost, uh, those of us who were in favor of, uh, of uh, what we call immigration patriotism, uh, uh, patriotic immigration reform to distinguish it from the other kind of immigration reform. They came along and stole the world with the world about 10 years ago. Um, we lost, and, and now the Bartley Purge National Review, which became a conservative operation, and it was impossible to, to discuss uh, uh, immigration for a long time, uh, 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 and we were able to keep it out of politics by yelling racist and all this kind of thing. And, they, and so they got Trump, and they deserve it. They deserve it for, for not responding to uh, to, to what obviously was was a real, a real profound concern. Um, the second point I think I would like to make is that this um, this uh, immigration issue, the immigration issue, and the alt right generally, you know, it's an international phenomenon. Uh, essentially, after, at the end of the Second World War, was in some ways a high point of the nation state because all the nations, the states of Europe, were nation states. They'd been, they'd been ethnically cleansed by, by the, the, the Germans and the Russians. Uh, and so they all represented specific nations. And, and uh, then they set about, over time, uh, dismantling that and going back to the chaos that had prevailed uh, in some ways before. Uh, in Britain, the immigration was all, became a problem in, in the late 40s, and it got worse and worse mm -hmm. until Enoch Powell made his great speech uh, in, in, in 68, and, and that stalled for a long time until, until Tony Blair came along. But it's also happening everywhere else in the world, and, and, and everywhere else in the first world. And we see exactly the same reaction everywhere else. Uh, the, the political elite uh, will not deal with this problem. And anybody who attempts to deal with it, it, it tries to anathematize. And in, in the case of, of Britain and, and the continent, they actually put people in prison for pointing out obvious facts like black immigrants commit disproportionate amounts of crimes and so on. And in Canada, you can get, get jailed for that kind of thing. Uh, so the, 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 the alien is not backing down, and the, the, the problem is getting worse and worse. In fact, it's, it's reached, it's, it's really, uh, in some ways, ultimate expression a couple of years ago with Angela Merkel who suddenly started to bring in vast amounts of people, really quite equivalent, if you look at the numbers, quite equivalent to the number of Germans who were born every year. The natural birth rate of Germany is practically matched by the, by the refugees she's bringing in. 
I used to say when I was on the road with David in my book, Alien Nation, 20 years ago, this was demographic transformation unprecedented in the history of the world, what the Americans were doing to themselves. But now, uh, America has surpassed them. And the amazing thing, the fascinating thing about America, of course, is Hillary Clinton's going to do exactly the same thing. She's openly said that if she gets into power, they're going to, they're going to pass to what they call a comprehensive immigration reform, which is basically amnesty plus an immigration surge. They're going to, they're going to stop enforcing the law of the border. We're going to, they, they, they mean to knock Republicans out democratically. Uh, they, of course, constantly say to any other that this, this is racism. But what their policy, of course, is, it actually is, is treason. Now, uh, and the third thing I'm going to say is, you know, there's going to be a hard landing here. There's going to be a hard landing. Uh, I, I, it's uh, 20 years ago, the Republican Party could have saved itself by, listen, by, uh, by defending, protecting its base uh, and, and, and cutting off immigration. And now America could save itself by cutting off the immigration moratorium. But I don't know that that's going to happen. I, I don't see looking at the reaction to Trump. Uh, uh, that uh, there's any conversation about immigration going on at all in, in the elite. They just want it to go away. Uh, uh, and, and there are extraordinary manifestations of people saying, um, what was that guy's name? Um, not E.J. Dion, the other not good at the New York Times. Uh, um, adults don't want allow Trump to be elected. What does he mean by that exactly? What are they going to do? You know, uh, 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 I don't see any sign of the change of course at all. So, so I have... Uh, kind of a, a, a bleak outlook. Someone was saying uh, a little while ago, asked Richard, was he, basically, was he a loyal American? I actually regard myself as a loyal American. Uh, uh, my son served in the Marine Corps. Um, I was very happy with America, as it was when I came in 1970. Uh, but I'm not making a normative statement here. I think it will break up. In, in some ways, I think that's the best we can hope for, that it breaks up. Because uh, otherwise, it's going to move to a third world, a third world tyranny. Uh, this is very annoying to me, particularly because I'm in so much trouble to get here, and uh, I'm um, at my advanced age. I have three little girls, one of them I'm brunette, <laughs> um, and all I can say is I'm very glad that my young wife is a Texan and knows how to shoot. Thank you. Could you expand? You said you think what the United States will break up? Could you expand on that? I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just, I'm just, just, I'm just, just speculation. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that the different, first of all, sectionalism, sectionalism has always been a part issue in American politics. Even uh, in the, uh, well, obviously before the Civil War, uh, uh, when, it, when the political nation was entirely wide. Uh, uh, you see it in Canada too, actually. I mean, it, it, these tremendous geographical distances do make differences to the community. So you see sectionalism developing. But that's going to be exacerbated because these sections are going to be as different from each other as any, any parts of the world. They're not going to speak the same language because I think it's obvious that unless something's done soon, it's going to be impossible to us to prevent the institutionalization of Spanish. They're not going to be the same race. They're not going to have anything in common. But they are going to be subsidizing each other because, and, and I think that will annoy us. People will get annoyed about it, and so we'll see this secession movement. These sections, what, what are we talking about, like sociological No, I'm talking about geographic. Well, it's a term of art, isn't it? I mean, geogra it's a term of art. I mean, geographical sections. But are, uh, we, talking, are we talking about uh, you can see political this. disunion in the United yeah. States with, like, you know, Fredonia, where Texas now is, and, you know, the I Eastern think, Republic of something around. I think the country will break up. I think people in the Pacific Northwest have very sadly got nothing in common with... Uh, with, with the rest of it. I actually think already that you see those movements in a large group of states that the states should break up. And that makes a lot of sense to me. These states are too big uh, to be to be political so, communities. When they break up, it's not into new states within the United States right. of America. It's to independent, sovereign nations. I don't know what will happen. I think we'll see in the first instance. For example, Texas, as you know, has the right to split into five and ten at once. That was part of it. If they, you can split into separate states within the American yeah. Union. And I th That's I think not that, what I'm talking about. I'm talking well, about yeah. That. Well, I, I would say I think we'll see that first. The, the political structure has to be articulated. It has to be made capable of, of, of handling it. I mean, that was the genius, the genius of federalism. We tried to represent several communities. Well, we've got a lot Those more are all states within, uh, well, the states as Hamilton one. put it, the global, you right. know, the greater sphere, right? right? That's not what you're talking about. I, I think that the, 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 the uh, assumption of federalist two, which is that we're all one people, <coughs> speaking one language from the same uh, 
in the same origins has been destroyed by the immigration policy. So can, can we stay as a uh, political entity? I think, I think it would be a problem. Yeah, two questions. Um, first, do you have any thoughts on worship today? Um, and second, what do you think the new leads pay attention to? And then second, if Trump's elected, are there ways that you'd like to see Uh, Russia Today, I, I'm one of these people who depends where I have that email, and so I, I do see people send me stuff from Russia Today very, very regularly. I mean, the thing about Putin is, without knowing anything more about him, I'm quite sure that Trump doesn't know anything more about him either, but he is a nationalist, and that's what Trump is, he's a nationalist. He's not a conservative, he's a nationalist. Yeah. And that's a big change from, from, uh, from the Republican uh, establishment, who have slowly so, so slid into being globalists with a certain amount of... Uh, uh, weeping eagle veneer, you know. <laughs> so, 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 in in that very general sense, I could see, I could see uh, Trump and uh, uh, Putin were even perhaps seen as the same things. But um, fundamentally, they come from completely different political cultures, and they have nothing in common with So, y'all write this frequently described as white supremacist. Is that accurate? Um, I don't see how I, that. Well. Uh, I don't see he can argue that. I mean, in fact, one thing that Richard has said, and Richard is probably the most the most radical of any of the three of us here, uh, is, is he just simply wants uh, a white homeland, a white identity. Uh, he, he doesn't say anything he means to go around uh, oppressing people. Uh, in his technical sense, of course, uh, uh, it's, you know the, the IQ issue and so on. Uh, is, the, the, the white whites are not a superior race. They, in some ways, the East Asian is superior. Uh, uh, I, I like the term. I, I, I publish people on Vida who I would describe as white nationalists. That is to say, they, they, they are people who, who, who defend the interests of, of, of American whites, who, of course, until 1965 were called whites, or called Americans. There's, there's no discussion as to what race they were. Everybody knew that American meant white in those days until 1965. Now, one of them, Jared Taylor, has, has just said he doesn't like being called a white nationalist anymore because he thinks the term is too hopeless and smeared. And maybe that's right, but I think that's kind of a shame. You can have black nationalists, you can have Zionists, and I publish Zionists, and, and people, uh, I publish people arguing that uh, Kahana was right and, and uh, the, the Palestinians should be thrown, the Arabs should be thrown out of Israel. Uh, you know, I don't see why I can't publish people who are concerned about the interests of American whites. But we, we're not a white nationalist side, we're a forum side. Can so. I ask Mr. Spencer a follow-up question on the, question, uh, on the issue of white supremacy? No, you wait your turn. Thank you. Excuse me. Go ahead. Do you mind if I ask I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure I agree with what you're saying. Do you mind if I ask a question? Sure. We'll, we'll make you the last one in the journal. Right. Yeah. So do you think, um, I don't know if you saw the article uh, recently, it was a couple days ago in the Washington Post, um, highlighting a, I think, safe to call him a black nationalist out in the Midwest, I think, called for blacks across the country to separate from white America and that they don't need us. Do you think Hillary Clinton's going to give a speech on the, the dangers and racism of, of black separatism, removing themselves from white America in the same way she gave a speech about the alt-right? You mean the sister soldier moment, whatever that moment was called. Yeah, Do you uh, think she'll treat the that gentleman and the idea that he's putting forward with the same negative connotations that her speech presented to the to her? Her Let me put it this way. A, a, a couple of years ago, I was talking to a woman who had been a Republican Congress uh, uh, woman in, in, uh, in New York State, and she'd been defeated. And she's a liberal Republican. But she said to me, you know, the problem is that the Democrats are able to mobilize their constituents. They can play the identity politics card. They can mo they can appeal to their different identity, their different groups uh, on, on the basis of their identity. But we have nothing to counter that. Now, of course, what's happened is Trump implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly, is countering it because he's appealing to, to, to white America. Uh, so Hillary has no intention of taking that speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jared Taylor. Uh, you know, one term that we have in the old right, and actually this term you can find uh, in, in other places as well, like libertarians, is this idea of being red-pilled. It's from the matrix, you take the red pill of truth as opposed to the blue pill of delusion. Uh, well, I, I think I've always been a radical at heart, uh, philosophically, but I always avoid, I, or many years ago, so I guess 15 years ago or so now, I always wanted to avoid the, the race issue, it just, it, it, it felt uh, icky, I didn't want to talk about it, could get you in trouble, and so on. 
Uh, and I, I can I can say that Jared Taylor red pilled me. Uh, he was the he was the person I looked to who could talk about race uh, in a rational manner, but also in an inspiring manner. So. Jared, um, I don't know if I should thank you or blame you um, <laughs> for my uh, career, but thank you, Jared. <laughs> No, the fact is, in America today, you can never be happy again once you oh, fully understand uh, race. So I apologize, yeah, we'll make it. Richard. Uh, <laughs> um, I would describe the alt right as a broadly dissident movement, a little like the dissident movement uh, in the old Soviet Union. We are dissident in the sense that we reject egalitarian orthodoxy. And the egalitarian orthodoxy in which the alt right is in unanimity about rejecting and rejects probably with the most enthusiasm is the idea that the races are basically equivalent and interchangeable. Uh, Richard touched on this, but race is real. It's a biological fact. Does anyone in this room really think the differences between pygmies and Danes and Australian Aborigines is some sort of social construct? Really, this idea is so wrong and so stupid that only very intelligent people can possibly persuade themselves that it's true. The races have been evolving separately for tens of thousands of years. And to somehow look at these differences and make them go away simply by calling them social constructs is utter fantasy. Now, the races differ in all sorts of ways. They differ in susceptibility to disease, disease rates. They differ in the ways they react to drugs for medical purposes. They also differ, as a matter of fact, in the patterns of the microbes that inhabit their mouths. Did you realize that you can tell races apart by what's living in your mouth? Now, the microbes that decide to take up residence in your mouth are not a social construct. It's part of biology. Now, of course, the aspect of race and racial differences that has been most carefully studied and is at the present time most controversial is the question of average IQ. We have very good data on this subject going back 100 years. And now it's very, very clear that East Asians have the highest IQ. It's at about an average of 102, 103. Next come whites at about 100. Next come Hispanics, which is a very varied population, hard to put a firm figure on them. And then blacks have an average IQ of about 85. Now, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming that there is a substantial genetic contribution whether we like it or not. Now, in the United States, there are about 13,500 school districts. In every one of them, so far as I know, the standardized test scores sort themselves out exactly as I have described. Asians at the top, then we get whites, then we get Hispanics, then we get blacks. Now, of course, you have all been told over and over and over again that IQ tests are biased, they are biased in favor of whites, made by whites for the benefit of whites. Well, why is it that Asians score higher on them than whites? And let me give you just a little brief ref refutation of this cultural bias idea. There's something called the reverse digit test. If I repeat a series of numbers to you, say 45862, and ask you to repeat them back in that order, that's a memory test. If I asked you to reverse them in your mind and then repeat them back, that is a test of mental ability. It takes some doing to rearrange those numbers. And as it turns out, on the results of the reverse digit test, as the series gets longer and longer, Asians do better than whites, whites do better than Hispanics, Hispanics do better than blacks. And I don't think any of us can imagine Asian parents somehow quietly coaching their children in the reverse <coughs> digit test. No, this is an entirely culture-free test that reflects what is, in fact, a biological fact. Influenced by environment, but is a biological fact. Now, this is harsh doctrine, I understand. But it is a harsh doctrine that whites are compelled to talk about. Because otherwise, they are blamed for the failures of blacks and Hispanics in particular. They are blamed for shortcomings that are absolutely not their fault. And by constantly blaming whites, this stokes resentment in blacks and Hispanics, and likewise among whites, being blamed for things that are not their responsibility. As a matter of fact, 
The world in general is incomprehensible if we don't understand the fundamental facts about race. Why is Africa cruel? Why is, on the other hand, Haiti equally cruel? Their histories are completely different. And yet, in terms of the indices of underdevelopment, they are practically indistinguishable. This is because they're populated by the same people. Again, this is harsh doctrine. But these are the facts that we must face if we are to understand the world we live in. Now, the ladies and gentlemen of the press here, if they go home and they write about this aspect of our discussion, will say, oh, this is all discredited pseudoscience. No, no. Arthur Jensen has not been discredited. Linda Gottfried has not been discredited. No. Uh, Richard Hernson, Charles Murray, Robert Plum, Michael Woodward. These people have not been discredited. And I can assure you, you can build the farm. At some point, the genes that code for intelligence will be isolated. And it will be found that the alleles that are associated with high intelligence are not distributed equally among all the different human groups. So you had better start preparing your mind for this reality sooner rather than later. Another aspect of the alt-right's understanding of race is that it is an essential part of human, individual, and group identity. This is something that is taken for granted for all people but whites. I'll put it this way. What do you call a black person who prefers the company of blacks and black color? A black person. What do you call a white person who prefers the company of whites, classical music, and the culture of Europe? A Nazi. A Nazi. <laughs> yes. This is obviously a double standard. Every other group understands that they are allowed to take pride in their heritage and who they are. At the same time, we are a tribal species. We prefer to be among the company of people who share our values, our culture, and even our biology. And that is why, for example, church congregations in the United States, 95% of them are at least 80% one race. And many are 100% one race. Why is this? It's because church congregations reflect complete freedom of association. Churches are among the few institutions in America that the government has not tried forcibly to integrate. And so when Americans are left entirely to their own preferences, they sort themselves out by race. Another aspect of race that the alt-right recognizes is that whites have interests as a group, just as every other race has. One of the obvious interests is not to be reduced to a minority in the United States or anywhere else where whites are already a majority. I do not want my country to become one in which my children and grandchildren are not only a racial minority, but at the rate things are going now, a hated and despised minority. Now, conservatism has completely abandoned these questions. You will never hear a so-called conservative talking about the importance of race and IQ, the idea of white racial identity, or the legitimate interests of whites. This wasn't always the case. Some of you may know that at one time, National Review discussed these questions. It was editorially in favor of apartheid in South Africa. It was in favor of segregation in the South. No more. They have completely abandoned this central aspect of human reality. Now, conservatives are no different from people like myself, in that they prefer the culture of Europe, they prefer to be around people like themselves. And I would go further and point out that liberals are in fact the same. As the great Joe Sobern pointed out, in their mating and migratory habits, liberals are indistinguishable from members of the Ku Klux Klan. And I know that millions and millions of Americans agree with me because I don't listen to what they say. I look at what they do. And if you, if you are actually to ask most whites, liberal or otherwise, to name a single majority black or Hispanic neighborhood they'd like to live in, they can't think of a single one. Or a majority black or Hispanic school they'd like to send their children to. No, can't think of one. And yet, they mouth these ideas of diversity and they support policies that are reducing whites to minority all around the world, turning neighborhood after neighborhood 
school after school, into precisely the kind of place where they would not live and they don't want their children to be part of it. The hypocrisy on this stinks. The stench of hypocrisy when it comes to diversity and race is almost intolerable. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, they go on and on about the joys of diversity. But when they left the White House, where did they choose to buy? Chappaqua, New York. It's hard to find a whiter place this side of ice cream than Chappaqua. <laughs> <laughs> so let's meditate further on this question of diversity. The idea seems to be that in the 1950s, whites were just about to choke to death on their own homogeneity until at the last minute they were saved by Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. Oh, it was a close shave. <laughs> And so whites are required to say yes, yes, they approve of diversity. Diversity is not only a strength for America, it's its greatest strength. Well, let's think about this. When you ask whites to celebrate diversity, you are asking them to celebrate their dwindling numbers, their diminishing influence. Only a thoroughly insane people would do this. Only sick and deluded people of welcoming their march towards oblivion, which is exactly what egalitarian orthodoxy requires of whites. Now, white people are the only people capable of this kind of self love Imagine going to China and saying, oh, you've got a pretty nice country here, but there's just too damn many Chinese. You need to ginger the place up. Yeah, yeah, a few Guatemalans, would that be good for you? Pakistanis? Malays, oh yes, Zulus, they're a good part of the mix too. That way you'll have a wonderful diverse country. They would send for the men in the white coats. They wouldn't tolerate this kind of stuff. Only whites have been browbeaten into thinking that it's some kind of virtue to march off the stage of history. Now, let me conclude with a few remarks about white supremacy. The ladies and gentlemen of the press love to call people like me white supremacists. And I know why that is. Because if you're looking for a term to discredit a white person, nothing is more effective, nothing is more emotionally than white supremacists. This is the atom bomb of insults. There is no more emotionally traded way to say this person may be ignored. It's a way of saying he is evil, unhinged, and an ignorance. Now, when the ladies and gentlemen of the press use this term, not only are they simply wrong, they're really badly misinforming their readers. A white supremacist, if such a person exists, presumably wants to rule over people of other races. I don't think there is a single member of the alt-right, out of the open or even in the shadows, who has such a desire. We want to be left alone. We want to have the chance to pursue our own agenda, unfettered by the presence of and if you redefine white supremacy in terms of belief that whites are the superior race, that too is something that any informed member of the all right does not hold that position across the board by any means. As suggested, as uh, Peter Bremel was pointing out, in terms of IQ, East Asians are superior to whites. And not just in IQ, in terms of crime rates, in terms of illegitimacy rates you could very effectively argue that East Asians are objectively superior to whites. Does that make us yellow supremacists? I don't think so. In any case, white supremacist is a completely bogus term that should be retired from the contemporary American language. I also reject the idea of being a racist. Now, whatever that term means, and it means anything that a liberal who's losing an argument with someone like me wants it, but whatever it means, it is morally opposed. It means you're a moral inferior. Not at all. My understanding of race and that the all right is what it is based on the firm grounding of biology. It is consistent with history, human nature, and it is perfectly and profoundly moral. Now, I would conclude by saying that the ideas of the all right are gaining ground rapidly. Trump or no Trump. Trump is, in my view, almost irrelevant to the ideas of the all right. We are gaining ground because we are right. We see the world correctly. 
The way we understand things makes it possible to talk about solving problems that liberals can't even begin to understand because they are so blinded by these egalitarian orthodoxies that we reject. America is changing. The world is changing. And we're going to lead those changes. Thank you. Let's do this. Um, first, yeah, Peter, you can come up too. Um, let's say uh, first, let's take some questions specifically for Jared, and then we can just we have the room until for another forty-five minutes, so we can we can talk to you and we can talk to you afterward. So let's take questions for Jared uh, first. Okay, nothing about DC voting. Right? So I'll get to that in a second. How how is the alt right not its own orthodoxy, and if how is it ever going to defeat people who believe in democracy? Want to just end up like you know two big splits like Protestants and Catholics on how to run modern society? Uh, I don't think the alt right takes much of a position on the question of democracy at all. In fact, I'm always intrigued when people accuse Donald Trump of being a menace to democracy, or uh, Jean-Luc Le Pen is a threat to democracy. I mean, what does that mean? That means that in spite of not getting a majority of the vote, they're going to take power, or if they voted out of office, they're not going to leave. This makes no sense. I think that that question is an irrelevance as far as the alt-right in, in any kind of uh, united sense is concerned. There may be very different ideas about what forms democracy should take, how states should be governed. But that is very much a debate within the, within the alt-right. And as you were asking earlier, how do we avoid becoming an orthodox? Well, there's no one here who can, afford, who can enforce orthodoxy. We're just burgeoning this uh, constantly growing world of websites, podcasts, publishers, radio broadcasts, video broadcasts. Nobody's policing it. It's growing up in a spontaneous way, but it's taking a coherent form because for the most part, as I said before, we are based on a correct understanding of history and human nature. Yes, sir. Um, so on this matter of white supremacy, mm. so I, I was reading uh, Michael Levin's book on uh, Why Race Matters, mm. and, which I think is actually sold on some of your, maybe on your website. Yes, yes, we, yeah. we, we published it. Yes. So, okay, so here's a quote from uh, Michael Levin's book, and you tell me, uh, you know, what you make of it, if you support it or don't, or critique it or don't critique it. Here's the quote. Um, it follows that by ordinary corpusoid standards, the average white is a better person than the average black. A greater proportion of black than white behavior also fall, falls below the ordinary thresholds of decency and tolerability. What's your position on that part? He's perfectly welcome to hold that point of view. But by the standards, by the standards that uh, Michael Leffert is setting up to arrive at that conclusion, you could make exactly the same statements about whites as opposed to Asians. As I said before, in terms of intelligence, crime rates, illegitimacy rates. Wait, they, build, they, build, they build much more orderly societies than we do. Yeah, now, do you agree you, with this statement or not? If you take his assumptions, if you assume his assumptions are correct, if he's talking about athletic prowess, then he's wrong. I think it's clear that blacks are better athletes. The than standards whites. are ordinary corpus standards embracing not only athleticism, but intelligence and ethical behavior. If you include athleticism, then it doesn't apply. Let, let's hold it. Uh, and I'll shut up. We'll pick up. One question. If, if the corpusoid standards refer yeah. to ethical behavior, do you agree with this statement or not? Probably, on balance. Ethics are correlated with intelligence. More intelligent people tend to be more ethical and more trusting of others. And a higher IQ group is likely to build a society in which there is more common trust. Yes. Could I, yes, could I add that? something to that real quickly? Well, I, I, I just add to that. I, I think what the caucasoid standards, I, I think perspective matters. I don't think, I, I don't believe that there's one moral standard to the universe or anything like that. I think everything comes from a perspective. Uh, so from our perspective, yes, uh, most Africans are not gonna be uh, white people. But from their perspective, people? 
Well, I mean, let's that's kind of back to you, Matt. I mean, well, that's look, the quote. I'm not Mike. Look, look, average look, white I'm, is I'm better than what the average black Michael, person. Michael Levin's not here. I mean, I'm going to say what I'm saying. I'm going to ask you what you I, think of But that. I'm going to define it in my own words because I don't really use those words of analytic okay. philosophy, to be honest. Um, it, everything comes from a perspective. So I think some of these things, like even like a, a controversy, like not standing for the American flag. I, I think that expresses a real and authentic sense amongst many blacks that they aren't part of American society, which still is defined by white norms. That, they're, that it doesn't always work. They don't feel like they're part of the team. And I understand them. I, I actually understand Black Lives Matter on a, on a fundamental level. That doesn't mean that I approve of them or endorse them. But I, in a way, understand that deep hurt that, that is that where they're coming from. They don't feel like they're part of white America. Um, if I were living in Beijing, I actually was just in a vacation in Japan. Um, I loved it, and I loved the Japanese people, but I felt very alienated. It's it's not for me. I I, I was lost, uh, and so I, I think that I think I would stress the perspectives. I mean, for me, European culture is the greatest. Uh, but also, I mean, my dog is the greatest dog. Uh, you know, by objective standards, he probably falls very short. But it's, it's he's my dog, and also European culture. I mean, I, I admire East Asians. Uh, there's there's no one from their culture that I can tell that that's their Beethoven. Uh, it's it, because it's not mine. It's not coming from the things that I value. So I think if we could have a, a perspectival understanding of this, I, I think we could actually have understanding. Yeah. Uh, to what extent do you think the role um, single motherhood plays in the race crime disparity? And do you think the way that that's incentivized by certain government policies, do you think that's something that, uh, if shifted, could mitigate the, uh, the high crime rate, or do you think it's it's pretty uh, innate? I think the patterns we see in racial differences in behavior are a combination of both genetics and environment. And if you have a society that rewards reckless procreation, you're going to get more of it. And that puts people off for bad stuff. Now, uh, what the left often does is they will look at a correlation, such as how much did the house cost that these people are living in? And if you live in a $400,000 house, you're less likely to be uh, have an illegitimate child or, be, or end up in jail. And the implication somehow is that if we could all live in $400,000 houses, we'd all be much better. The fact is, if your parents gave them, uh, brought you into the world as an illegitimate child, if they have also given you a deprived up upbringing, they probably gave you a less than average set of genes to begin with. So there is a kind of vicious cycle here. But none of this is to refute the important genetic contribution. And it's important to realize that the experiment has been made. When you take black children who are up for adoption and rear them in middle class white households, during the early years, there is an effect on IQ and other behavior. But as these black children get older and older, their natural genetic tendencies begin to assert themselves. And by age 18 or so, the differences between them and controlled blacks have essentially glimmered away. So it's a combination of the two. But the capital error of the egalitarians is completely to ignore the, the genetic component. Yes, sir. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the parentheses and everything related to that. I'm just wondering to what extent you think that that is satirical, and if it's not, to what extent does the alt-right believe that Jewish heritage is a disruptor or even a threat to Western civilization? I can't tell you to what extent it is satirical. I think these days, just as many people in the youth, they want to be as shocking as possible. Right. And if you want to shock, I mean, what more shocking thing than gas the kites? Now, that's about as shocking as you can possibly be in contemporary America. How much of that reflects a deep and uh, detailed study of National Socialism, and how much of it does it reflect some kind of just épaté les bourgeois, kind of like this, uh, a desire to astonish? I can't say. Now, there is a, there is a broad spectrum of opinions within the alt-right as to the role of Jews in uh, Western societies, the extent to which Jews are welcome or should be welcome, in, um, in the alt-right to which they can contribute to a consciousness of whites as a believing people. Uh, I tend to be among those who thinks that uh, European Jews are very much part of our movement. Some people say that no, Jews should not be part of our movement. But there's, a, a, there's an enormous spectrum of opinion on that question. 
Thank you. Your SPLC certified on <laughs> the SPLC certified. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I don't usually take what they say very serious. What I'm saying here, ladies and gentlemen, is that Mark Potter of the SPLC has actually uh, 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 certified uh, Jared as being not allowed to submit it, which are very nice of them. But since it's <laughs> always lied, no, I'm not going to make it. Yes. Uh, Excuse me, just follow up to that question. Sure. I know there's some tension with the outright about how far to go sometimes with the rhetoric, uh, and in particular when it comes to Jews, I'd like you all to answer this question, what are your thoughts and how are your feelings on this notion among, that is held among some members of the alt-right that there is a vast Jewish conspiracy to undermine white solidarity? Well, uh, I'll be happy to answer that first. I think it is unquestionable that there have been uh, there has been an overrepresentation by Jews in intellectuals who have tried to undermine the legitimacy of white racial consciousness. Uh, I think uh, Kevin McDonald has shown this, others have shown this, and I think that uh, these are simple facts. Does that therefore mean that all Jews are somehow enemies of the white race? I reject that. I reject it completely. And I think that just because, for example, Episcopalians are more likely to be opposed to white racial solidarity as opposed to Southern Baptists. Does that mean that Episcopalians are enemies of white race? That's obviously not a perfect parallel. But uh, I don't think that this means that a Jewish American or a European Jew cannot be a fully committed man of the West who wishes our race and our civilization to survive. Uh, I would just add that uh, I, I think most in the alt-right would recognize that Jews have their own identity. Um, and that they're not European. And I think to tell a Jew that he's a man of the West or a European is to really undermine him. Uh, Jews have a very different history than Europeans, the people who, who, who defined European society and European culture. I think it's, a, it's, it's just a very sensible and down-to-earth way to recognize that Jews are Jews. And also that I, I might disagree with a great deal of Zionist policy, but uh, excuse me, not Zionist policy, uh, Israeli policy, foreign policy. But I actually fundamentally understand the impulse towards Zionism. The impulse towards Zionism is fundamentally a nationalistic impulse. It's a concept of usness. They didn't, the Zionism was not created so that a democracy, whatever that means, could be installed in the Middle East. Zionism was created to protect the Jewish people and fundamentally to protect Jewish history and Jewish religion. So I understand that nationalist impulse. I think saying that Jews are just white or European, I, I think that's to undermine Jews. Uh, Jews are a sep they, they are they are their own people. I do believe there's a conspiracy. Well, uh, I would I would echo what Jared said. I, when you say cons I think when people say a conspiracy, that's kind of like the racist word. It, it's not a real word. Like, are you a racist? You know, kind of thing. It, it's it's just a you know. When you hear conspiracy, you hear conspiracy theory, and like the Queen of England is a reptile and she's ruling humanity. You know, it's it's ridiculous. Um, I, I think that you would, I mean, in, in terms of overrepresentation in left wing movements or so on, uh, that is obvious. Um, is there is there something about uh, Jews that they feel a certain apartness from society that might lead them towards being becoming interested in certain ideas or movements? I think there's a lot to that. I think that makes sense intellectually. But to say that there's a conspiracy, like we can open up a room and there are these people in there scheming about uh, destroying the world or the white race, it, it, that, that's ridiculous. John, would you want that? Sure, uh, if you would mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, put, put in my head in, in the lion's mouth here. Um, uh, I'm sort of midway between Jared and uh, Richard on this. Uh, uh, essentially group job, uh, but we do publish uh, as part of our very liberal poll publishing policy, Kevin MacDonald, who investigates the question of why, is, why it is that the Jewish organizations, for example, every single major Jewish organization was in favor of amnesty, for what they said were Jewish reasons. And this is a really odd situation. I mean, we have um, Jewish donors and Jewish writers, but the fact that I mean, you can't get away from the fact that the Jewish organizations are, are, are 100% on, on the wrong side. Some years ago, Center for Immigration Studies, which is sort of very politically correct, uh, in our view, fairly cowardly uh, immigration patriot group with here within the Broadway, had a, a, a fellow, I think he's still there actually, Steve Steinlein, who 
who was Jewish and who was an immigration patriot. And his job was to go out to Jewish congregations all around the country and try to explain them why they should be uh, in favor of the reduction of immigration. Needless to say, he had a hard time. And he, once he gave a speech in which he said, you know, the fact is, Jews disproportionately represented every kind of craziness. And I think that's a fair, that's, that's a fairly fair statement. Uh, on the other hand, having said that, I mean, I think that the Jewish organizations, uh, and particularly the extreme rhetoric that used, for example, against Trump, who's never said a word against them. Uh, and one of, one of the forms of craziness, by the way, that Jews are represented is that Jew, that's Trump's chief speechwriter on the immigration issue is Jewish. Um, uh, I think that the, the Jewish organizations make an, a historic blunder, uh, and, and uh, if my pessimism about the future of the country uh, is correct, they will pay for it. Well, no, it's still your, it's still your turn. Uh, I'm older than you, I <laughs> <laughs> Are there any female alt-right leaders? Uh, there are certainly female participants. There are quite a few, but I can't think of, well, let's see. Uh, the people at Red Ice Radio, for example, and a laptop. Uh, and uh, there are others that I know who work uh, under pseudonyms. But like, like any, like any vanguard movement, it's majority men. I think that's uh, just part of the human situation. But uh, they will join us. Just lots, lots, of all right lots of all-right fans. Lots of all-right fans are women who are What percentage would you say? Uh, smaller, I mean, I, I, it's hard to estimate. I mean, uh, if I, would, if I were just to throw out a number, 20% or something like that, I mean, it's overwhelmingly male. My other question was going to be, you talked a lot about nationalism and race. Does religion play any role in the alt-right movement? Um, right. I would say it's a, not, a, not a primary role. This is not a Protestant movement or a Catholic movement or even a Christian movement. Um, I, I, it might play a role in the sense that we recognize Islam in a way as, as a kind of banner um, of a threat to, a, to the West. Uh, it's a civilization in a way more, it's very different than, than being a religion as we know it, being a Methodist or something. Uh, but I, I would say that generally speaking, again, if I were just to estimate in terms of people who I've met, uh, there is a great deal of agnosticism or skepticism. Uh, th this is not, a, uh, this is not a, a movement that would expel anyone for believing or disbelieving. I, I think we would also probably say that for a, a traditional Christian um, that, um, they have a great deal to benefit from our movement. I think to protect the kind of Christianity that I admire and that other non-believers admire, um, it would be in a European society, that that's how you would build something like Rome. Um, you're not going to do that in a third world society. Yeah, it, uh, it's a very young movement, and young people across the board are moving away from religion in the United States. And I think the alt-right is absolutely no different than that. Like, it's not a central element in all. Well, I would I would make a, a distinction. The alt right is a a it's a a, a banner for a, a large degree of, intel, of an intellectual movement and a social movement and an activist movement. Um, so could a could a Jew be a part of that in that sense, like write good stuff or contribute or something like that? Sure, of course, it's not a party. Um, but as I would as I would define Europeans, no, Europeans are Europeans and Jews are Jews. To call Jews European is to insult their being and their history. So I would never do that. And then, um, like when you talk about envisioning a white homeland or sort of a white separatist white nationalist society. Uh -huh. Uh, I'll well, say this, my talking about an ethno state is, is a, a general word for that. Um, I think it's very important that the ethno state be a dream, it is a utopia in a sense. I think it would be ridiculous to start defining it right now. Uh, it's something for the future, it's very simple. It's very similar to the idea of Zionism for Jews in the 19th century. It's actually very similar to the ideal of communism for the left in the 19th century. It's something that's it's not here, it's, it's in the future, we should dream about it. Uh, but my ideal for an ethnostate state is actually a very new type of society. Uh, it is a society that would be a homeland for all Europeans. So it would not be a nation state as we understand it. It would not be the Czech Republic. It would actually be a large, probably imperial form, 
that would be a homeland for all Europeans. Again, this is highly utopian. This is not going to happen next Tuesday. Uh, this is very similar to the left with the left always operates on an ideal. The, the left can be extremely pragmatic. They can be ruthless. But there's always that dream in the back of their heads. And I think the right lacks that. The right always reacts to things. They're, oh, we don't like gay marriage. We don't like high taxes. We don't like this or that. It's a very negative movement. Negative movements are never going to accomplish anything. You need that big, bold, voluptuous dream to motivate you. So I think that is something that distinguishes the alt-right from cucks. Um, but in, in terms of a European homeland, no, it would be a European homeland. I would, I would, uh, I, I would certainly have. We would have fine relationships with a uh, with a Jewish homeland. We would not want to undermine that. We un we understand the Zionist impulse in a way that others don't. We understand that idea of being together, of being of of, of dream, of having a unity, having a homeland that's a protection for them. We want that too. My, my, my position would be different in that uh, I don't think that if a Jewish person identifies with the West and with Europe, that that's something that we should deny to someone just because he's a Jew, any more than I, as an American, whose ancestors have been in this country for more than 300 years, identify not just as an American, but as a European, as part of the worldwide brotherhood of Europeans. You can be Irish, you can be French, and you can think of yourself as a man of the West. Now, the numbers of Jews who would think of themselves in those terms may be small, but I don't think that it is an insult to them to deny them that option. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned at the outset that the all is having kind of a watershed media moment because yeah. of the campaign. Um, is there a plan to keep that going once the campaign's longer in the cycle, and what does that plan look like to kind of see the momentum and generate it in terms of media coverage? Very good question, and it's a pragmatic question. Um, yes, even even if Trump wins, I think there probably will be a little bit of a drop off, just in sense of where, where there's all this building and building and building at the election. Uh, certainly, we have been, uh, you could say, riding his coattails. There's been more interest in us because we are generally pro-Trump, because uh, we, we we were inspired by him and things like that. Um, I think the big challenge for the alt right is a a professionalization. It was funny, I was actually on a, a I had a conversation with, uh, I was on a Box Days uh, podcast, and uh, we were talking about this, he says, oh no, it's good to be totally diffuse and anonymous and online, well, similar to Gamergate, where they said, oh, there is no leader of Gamergate, uh, or, or I'm the leader of Gamergate, it's kind of like saying I'm Spartacus or something, and I, I think there is a, a degree, there's a, there's a, a lot of that to the alt-right, it is diffuse, there is no one leader, and if someone declares himself the leader, that's the first <laughs> he'll be attacked and, and ridiculed if it's not a good strategy. And I think that's good that it's organic and, and, and diffuse and has lots of different nodes. But I think for, for me in particular, I think one of the big challenges is professionalization in the future. Um, we, I understand people wanting to be anonymous, but we've got to get beyond that. We, we've got to have professional organizations uh, we want to have we, professional organizations, professional people doing it. We've got to amp up what we're already doing. We're already doing a tremendous amount in terms of book publishing, in terms of writing and things like that. I think we need to increase this. Uh, we want to increase our exposure, we want to increase our influence. Uh, we're doing that in a little way. Things are really changing and breaking in that sense. Uh, we've just got to go more of it. And I do think that there's going to be, it's a, there's going to be kind of a hangover moment, no matter what happens in November. And uh, it, it's the, the, our, our leaders are going to be the ones who are just keep pushing forward. E even if Trump wins, we might have to become critics of Trump. The thing is, we, we can't be a Trump cheerleading squad. Uh, if Trump disappoints us, we've got to go after him. Actually, there was a test of that when Trump did have this moment of ambiguity for a couple of weeks, or he was softening. Uh, it was midsummer. Um, a number of us were talking about this in back channels, but we're, we're talking about it openly as well. Uh, we were thinking, are we going to have to turn on him? We can't let him do this. I think that's good. I don't think we're going to get anywhere by being fans of politicians. Uh, so anyway, that was a roundabout way of talking about it. Yes. Uh, hello again. Hi, how are you? Um, so you were talking about professionalization. Yeah. You, you, you'd need money to do that. Yes. Where do you, where do you get the money? Oh, well, plaid. I mean. I'm sorry. Uh, 
<laughs> the same way everybody else does. You, you raise money. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I was joking. I said Vlad. Uh, uh, Vlad. No, I mean, do you have big donors? Do you have is there huge brothers We're going to find that out because one thing I am certain. Uh, whether the alt-right triumphs or not, uh, conservatism is dead. Uh, I mean, conservatism is a joke. And I, concern, no one's going to look to this movement, which is staffed by sub-mediocrities, as some kind of powerful movement. So there, we, you know, we, we certainly have donors now. Um, you know, we're, we're not operating on pixie dust. Uh, but uh, we're obviously going to have part of the professionalization is, of course, fundraising. So you're saying that you don't like the idea of any one person, you know, saying that they're the leader of the all right, but isn't that sort of exactly what the three of you are doing right now by having this press conference? Well, uh, look, no, we're not, we're not, I'm not declaring ourselves the priest of the all right where our word is dogma and, and so on. We are, we are standing up as three important nodes in the alt-right, three important leaders in the alt-right. Uh, I would be happy to represent the alt-right, uh, you know, for the media, for, for other people, um, but I would not claim that I am the alt-right or that my agenda rules. Again, it's not so much that I don't want to do that for some moral reason. If I did that, <laughs> I, I, it would, they, they wouldn't accept it. I mean, the, the alt-right, for better or for worse, the alt-right is a very independent movement and it has a lot of different people in it. Well, Rosie, the reason we three are here has as much to do with the fact that we are among the few alt-right spokesmen who are prepared to face the cameras. In this land of the free, the home of the brave, very few can afford to be straightforward about this. If I were a junior faculty member working for tenure, I couldn't say these things. If I were working for a big corporation and were on record as saying some of the things I've said, I'd be out immediately. It's in this soft totalitarian environment in which we live that, in a way, we are limited to the three of us here. If we could have people anonymously on, you would have many, many people who speak for the all right. It's just that not very many of us can afford to be out of the closet on this. Well, I, uh, how then does the and your ages. How then does the culture of Washington, D.C., which votes 99% for Democrats every presidential election, how does that pose an issue to the professionalization of the uh, It doesn't pose an issue at all. I mean, it, that, that's a, a voting record. The alt right is not going to be elected to anything. The alt right wants to influence people. Uh, no one ever voted for the neocons. Uh, and yet the neocons had tremendous influence in creating chaos. Uh, uh, we want to we want to influence people. So it doesn't matter how people vote in the district. So you, know, so you need to like come out to your neighbors and friends and all the other people who, you know, you know, live in DC if you are an alt right to influence not, them. Not really. I, I, I you're 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 really obsessed with DC. <laughs> That's uh, not like they're, they're, uh, <laughs> no, I mean we can have we can have a, a facility in, in, in D.C. that is that is us. Lots of people might look at us scared or, or disapproving looks. That that's okay. I can take it. Uh, but there, are, you know, you would have people in the alt right who live in, you know, uh, Wyoming and California and Germany and and Russia and, and Italy and things like that. It, it, it doesn't. Yeah, it just. Um, your questions are always based on false assumptions, and you keep asking them. How is true that in, the, in my case, the right and I have a lot of all right people uh, do tend to live in the waiting speed. Uh, they do tend to do conservative any time job, which is why they can't be today. I have a slightly different perspective on that. I think that, that we can be influential yeah, okay. outside of politics, and there's no reason why people in the hard right cannot also run their office. None of these, these things do not exclude each other. And I think that that will happen as well, probably at a lower level, city council, mayor, school board. These things will begin to happen because as I've kept saying, we have a view of the world that makes sense. And this will dawn on more and more people. And all of these things are applicable, not just in a larger geopolitical sense, but in your own school, in your own district, how race works itself out my, I feel my job will be done 
when at the PTA meeting, a woman gets up and says, well, of course there aren't as many blacks in the AP courses because they just not have the same average IQ and nobody objects. When that day comes, then I think my job will be done. But until that day comes, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of it can be done at the local level through elective office as well. Yeah, on that point, how much could be accomplished for your agenda just through a more robust freedom of association? Uh, well, uh, I, I'll admit, obviously there's something like the press club that's a, a, an appalling action. I mean, I, I recognize they're not a government facility, but they, they're literally their mission statement is free exchange of ideas. So. Uh, but I, I would say, look, uh, the biggest sensor is the one in people's minds. Um, it, it's you could, you know, I mean, you could, you could, people do vote with their feet, as Jared said, in terms of going into churches. Whenever they go into these churches, they talk about how unracist they are and how wonderful diversity is. So there is a problem, and we live in a, what Gramsci would call it, a hegemonic discourse of multiculturalism and, and liberalism. Uh, so we've actually got to fight a spiritual battle uh, before we can, before freedom of association is going to need to be tested. I mean, we just have free, we have freedom of association now. We have ethno states now. I mean, Sweden was the ethno state. Sorry, guys, Richard's iPhone is about to run out of power here. Fundamentally, our struggle is a struggle for the human soul and the, and the European soul, particularly. Uh, it's about reorienting the way we see the world, the way we want to engage in action. Uh, that's what it's about. And after, once you do that, it's actually very pragmatic to talk about all this touchy feely stuff like the soul. Once you change someone's soul, once you have a leader to have a, a different orientation, all the things like policy just flow from them. Um, so it's actually the most pragmatic way of uh, approaching things. We have, at the moment, we have a liberal soul, and therefore we have this society. But we have to change it at the root. Just changing a policy here and there, I actually find it fairly meaningless. The principle of freedom of association that has been denied in the United States and civilized out of the United States before. That's practically done. If instead of constantly trying to force people together, our government, our institutions, everyone basically took it for granted that we are a tribal species. That would be one, I think, very important step towards local institutions, local communities, even local regions, separating the way from most natural people. To what extent does the uh, very large uh, degree of intermarriage in the United States, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, an essentialist aspect of what you're talking about, you're, you're you know, it's organic, but you know, in fact, among all those groups, there's a lot of intermarriage. And to what extent is that a, uh, an ideological threat to uh, readiness? Uh, and, and, and to what extent is it a, uh, a, a salvation to those who worry about white people becoming a minority in like a generation? Because in fact, the people who get married with white people tend to identify as white. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I think you have to look at this from various perspectives. I mean, in terms of from a perspective of an American Jew, there is a tremendous amount of intermarriage. I think it's more than 15%. Um, and, and, and with, from their perspective, not necessarily from ours, this is a threat to Jewish identity in the sense that uh, people who are going to marry a, a Gentile, their children and their grandchildren are probably lose their sense of Jewishness. Uh, it is not really a threat to white identity, to be honest. That gives us a, just be simply because of numbers. Um, uh, in terms of intermarriage between you know Asians and whites or something, it, it's just not something significant that we really have to deal with. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just you know it's it's not like we have half of the country is, is East Asian and the other half is white, and we're all mixing. That's just simply not happening on that scale. So it's just not a, 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 it's not an important question. I, I don't feel like intermarriage is, is really threatening white identity. Um, in terms of you know a, someone who is mixed race or something like that, I bet they will have a, an identity crisis um, of, of, of some kind. Um, but you know I don't think we should really have a policy on something like that. I think that's kind of that's a, that's a personal. So 
I answer the question? Not quite. White, whites aren't going away. I mean, it, it, it's, it, I think there's some, like, if you watch network television, you would probably believe that half of the country is gay and the other half is, you know, Hispanic and a third is Asian and another quarter, you know, whatever. It doesn't add up. But it's, it's ridiculous. That's not what the country is. Well, there is a different perspective on this. Uh, last May, I had a debate with a black professor at Kentucky State University. And the question was whether or not diversity is good or bad for America. And I think in the 1940s position, I was able to speak this. He said one of the great things about diversity is that the more people of all kinds come and mix in the United States, and the more they intermarry, it means that 200 years from now, there will be no white people in America, and that's a good thing. So I think there is at least that perspective, but that goes unchallenged. Whereas I have been criticized many times for saying that I want my grandchildren to live like my grandparents, not like uh, Fu Manchu or Bobby Goldberg or Anwar Sadat. That apparently is a horrible thing for whites to say. But once again, this is all part of the current egalitarian zeitgeist that to wish to maintain one's heritage, so long as one's white is a bigoted thing, so long as you wish to be oneself, freedom of association, wanting one's self respect to follow in one's tradition. These are all essential parts of any healthy nation, and any step in that direction is good in my view. Hi. Uh, I have a question for any three of you, or all of you that want to answer. Do you think that if whites, uh, as many predict, will become uh, a minority in the United States, that would actually increase the level of uh, tolerance, really, for white identity politics? In fact, would you, would you consider losing? In fact, might mean that there is you know, a day where your PTA can be like a ballot distributor or something like that. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, and I, I, mean, there's, there's, I don't think there's one, there's one answer to it, because I might be of two minds of it myself. One thing I am certain of is that as whites become a minority, racial consciousness amongst whites will increase. I, I think it actually already has. I think the alt-right is an expression of this. The alt-right is in many ways a millennial and Gen X uh, rebellion against their egalitarian baby boomer parents. Uh, I think there's a generational aspect to the alt-right of questionable. Uh, so I think as whites become a minority and, and they become a, a put-upon minority, I, I think there will clearly be a heightening of racial consciousness amongst whites. Will a, a tolerance of white identity politics? I'm not so sure about that. I mean, you could say that that could happen. And if whites are 30% of the country in 2060, you know, of course we should have a whites congressional uh, group or a, a whites rights organization or a whites bowling club or whatever. Uh, but I'm actually not so sure about that because the the, there's this moral aspect to the world we live in, this, this unspoken uh, aspect to it, which is that we need to overcome the past. We need to overcome this, the, the idea that Europeans defined this, this yeah. continent. And I think that might remain. I could imagine whites being a minority and being a hated minority and not getting a seat at the diversity table. I, I think it's obvious that, and there's been some literature on this, technical literature on it, that as diversity is increasing, whites are migrating, for example, more to the Republican Party. It's a curious fact about American politics, which people don't seem to realize, that in the South, whites vote as high as 90% of the Republican Party. Uh, Texas, the demographics of Texas are very similar to the demographics of California, but the reason uh, Republicans care, care in Texas and don't care in California is that they don't care in California whites. But for some reason, Texas whites are much more uh, at, some, at some level, uh, 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 communally minded than, than, than California whites. So I think that's going to that is going to increase. You'll see whites increasingly migrating towards. We don't uh, uh, at Vida.com, we call it the, the GAP rather than GOP. It's the Generic American Party. Because obviously the GOP has done nothing whatever to deserve this, but it is by default the Generic American Party. It's part of American whites. On the other hand, I also think that we're going to see intensified pressure. Uh, uh, in, uh, when when uh, Obama uh, was elected, I gave a speech to the men uh, saying that the first thing they're going to put through hate crime legislation, which is basically privileging certain politically favored groups to destroy an equal, uh, equal, equal justice action. Uh, if you belong to a certain group and you're, you're attacked, then that's one matter of hate crime. I think if Clinton is elected, we'll very rapidly see a bunch of uh, move to hate speech. 
they're going to try and push that through, and they're going to try and re repress any discussion of immigration because you know, they're desperate to get this thing done. They're desperate to get new people elected, to get to drive American whites into a minority uh, before American whites wake up. Yes. So this question is for any one of you, um, and it's, so it's been apparent with uh, quite a few of the questions here, among other members of the press, the fascination or interest in what could be called the Jewish question or the Jewish perspective on the alt-right. Um, to what extent do you think that maybe the alt-right uh, might be, become seen more favorably among Jews, um, and specifically Jews in the United States, and in the U.S., and in Israel? Israeli Jews, if they sort of adopted the positions that Israel adopts as their own positions, specifically for whites, so maybe the Jews can sort of see, oh, these people aren't much, that much different from us. They specifically have uh, their own interests the same way we do. Do you think that would impact the Jewish perspective on the alt right? Well, I, I think that as we're talking about this, uh, uh, an overrepresentation of Jewish, uh, Jews in left wing movements, which is, is clearly a fact. Uh, I don't think that they would see it that way, uh, most Jews. I actually could imagine some uh, Israeli Jews, the Bibi Netanyahu types, uh, worrying about nuclear weapons going into the hands of a, a very radically different country, maybe having a different opinion on that. Uh, but um, I, look, I, I think we should pursue the truth. And I, I think we should stand for our identity. But in terms of having you know, diplomatic and respectful relations with all these countries, I mean, I, I think that's key. Uh, again, the, the old right, in terms of our foreign policy, I mean, it, it, it would be a much more realistic outlook. It would, it, would, it would see other powers not as something we need to bring democracy and freedom and, and, and so-called freedom and, and gay marriage to or whatever. You know the uh, neoconservatives and, and even their allies and, and their descendants want to do. I guess um, we, we would kind of deal with them rationally. So you know, a, 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 a Israel could deal with a, a very a, with an ethno state with a very different kind of American in the future. Sure. I guess maybe my, my question is poorly phrased. Maybe try this one this way. Um, so it seems like from an outside perspective, quite a few of the the positions that Mr. Gentleman have. Uh, put forward um, regarding the alt right, mere in many ways positions the Jewish community has for their own people or right. for their own self, their identity. So, I mean, what is it then about this where the alt right shared very similar views as far as specifically white identity that you think puts off non white, specifically Jews? Well, again, if people have different standards. I don't look, I don't, I even, you know, I might not approve of Black Lives Matter, but I, I actually understand where they're coming from. I would, I can understand Japanese nationalism uh, and, and, and agree with most of them. There are some people who have double standards who will have, you know, nationalism for me, but not for me. But, you know, where that's coming from, that's probably a problem. Uh, and it is three, so why don't we just take one more question and then I, I know I speak for myself, and I probably speak for uh, Peter, Jared, that we need a drink. I uh, know, uh, I'll definitely make it to the bar, but uh, uh, Jared won't. We'll be contemplating this common sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, let's take one more question, and then I will be, I will be happy to speak with journalists for hours afterwards. Uh, I don't, I, we're about you guys. Okay, uh, but it is after three, so we're gonna have to wait. So one more, you, last one, keep it just brief. Yeah, we uh, talked about uh, the National Review, and it's endorsed into part by the segregation. And I think it's just universal. And those were ideas that had white supremacy and that was that we did them, and you know, at least the perception was that part of that and uh, segregation were enforced with brutality. How do you come about to the you know, utopia that you described uh, without brutality? Uh, I, I think it, it could it, it obviously be achieved without any brutality, without any blood hitting the ground. Yeah. I mean, will it happen? Uh, obviously, uh, history is a slaughter bench, if we look back on it. Um, we have to be realistic about that. Uh, but it, it's just it's really just having an ideal. Uh, how something like that would come about, we'll, we'll know in the future. I, I think utopia is about what's necessary and 
way. Um, something like a, a white ethno state will present itself as necessary in the future. It's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna arise tomorrow. So it might very well not arise in my lifetime. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know, the uh, 1919, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, was a real example of liberals actually engaging in um, what you could call ethnic cleansing. It was done peacefully. Uh, that, that was a liberal Wilson -like effort. Uh, so that is an example of, of what could be done on an international basis. I don't think something like that will necessarily happen. Uh, but you just have to want it. You have to have an ideal that's inspiring. And how you get there is dependent upon history. Again, as this gentleman over here pointed out, voluntary freedom of association. I think that is really the key. Not very many people are going to have to be shoved in any particular direction. They will go voluntarily. And if there is some group of people who want to mix it up and have their multi culty paradise, God bless them too. I think that once our government and all of our institutions, which are combined in trying to maintain this futile fantasy of being a race being made not to matter, if those institutions would change their message, if our government realized that they're trying to accomplish something that's impossible, then that will open the door to much, much better solutions than anything that current orthodoxy can even contain. I'm not a libertarian uh, like Jared. Uh, I believe the state is existential. I think we need a state. You could allow people to go in wherever they want to be. They are within the same nation state as we are now. You're, you're in the same house. So uh, you, you really have to, you're, the state is going to define power you know, regionally and, and so on. So, you know, my ideal would be a, an ethno state. And the state is just as important to that as the ethno part. If you think about it, the Bolton Rights Act, in some ways, is an example of self segregation. Because the way that's worked out is that uh, it seems to have been agreed among the different races that they get the gerrymandered different uh, districts to, so that one or other race is represented. And this is very annoying to the left. Like we've run out of problems because they know that if they could decant enough minorities into their districts, that would strengthen them and get to the point where they could actually take these districts in elections. But by and large, it turns out that the, uh, uh, the minority uh, leader, and specifically the Obama administration, doesn't want that. They just want to maximize the number of black or Hispanic districts. Uh, so they're very quietly seem to have accepted the segregation of the voting rights. The voting rights act is not really about fraud, it's about making sure that. Uh, it's, it's about badge of stands, actually. We're creating, we're creating uh, uh, it's separate uh, racially based uh, districts where one or other race has complete control. Let's, and this is a huge philosophical discussion, so I'm going to put a bookmark in it, as I like to say, and we'll continue it uh, at the bar or wherever you'd like to be. First off, uh, please give yourself a hand for coming here. <laughs> Thank you.